is the meaning of living and non-living? The girl will be considered living because she can eat, breathe, talk, move, respond. All the things that make us alive. The doll will be non-living because it's not alive since it cannot do any of the mentioned activities just now. The doll will remain static. But the question now is, what keeps us alive? Before the 17th century, there was a theory called the vitalism theory that says we have a mysterious energy within us that keeps us alive. Today, we call that energy the soul. But scientifically, we cannot show the soul. Therefore, scientists continue to investigate what could keep us alive. After the 17th century, when microscopes were introduced, scientists came up with the cell theory to explain the concept of being alive. Join me in BioWorld today to explore the cell theory. According to the STPM syllabus, we will just need to be able to state the cell theory. However, I would like to share a little history on the cell theory. It was introduced way back in 1839 by three different German scientists, Jacob Schleiden, Theodor Schwann, and Rudolf Virchow. These three scientists came up with the original cell theory, which is made up of three parts. The first part states that all living things, both animals and plants, have cells as their basic unit of structure and function. Now, this is something that you already know today. But in the 17th century, this was a breakthrough idea. The second part of the theory states that living organisms can be made up of one or more cells, which today we call as unicellular organisms and multicellular organisms. And the third part to the theory is that all the cells originate from pre-existing cells through the process of cell division, which today we call as mitosis. Now, these concepts created by these three scientists were made possible by the technology that was available to them at that time, which was advancement in microscopes. However, over the years, many more new technologies have evolved and therefore the cell theory has been expanded. The modern cell theory still uses the first three parts of the original cell theory but adds another four parts to it. So the fourth part of the cell theory now is that Activities of an organism will depend on the total activity of all the cells inside the organism. Fifth part states that there is energy flowing within the cells, but this energy comes from the process of metabolism and biochemical reactions happening in each of the cells. Sixth part identifies that there is hereditary material in the form of DNA in the cells and that this DNA can be passed from cell to cell during mitosis or meiosis. Final part states that if the cells are from organisms of similar species, then the cells will have the same chemical composition. Now, most of what you have seen in the cell theory are facts that you already know. But 
these concepts were brand new when they were first introduced into the scientific world. Now we're done with the cell theory. Let's move on to discuss two types of cells, the prokaryotic cell and the eukaryotic cell. Here are three different microscope images of three different cells. The human sinus cells representing animal cells, onion cells representing plant cell, and bacteria. As you observe these microscope images, you can come up with a few conclusions. Firstly, the size of the cells. Looking at the scale used, you can see that the plant cell is the largest and the bacteria the smallest. Besides that, you can see the nucleus clearly in the animal and plant cell. But nucleus is not visible in bacteria. Added to that, you can see that the cytoplasm of the animal and plant cell have smaller structures in them. But the cytoplasm of the bacteria seem clear. These differences are the basis of animal cells and plant cells being placed in a different category than bacteria. Animal cells and plant cells are eukaryotes or eukaryotic cells, while bacteria are prokaryotes or prokaryotic cells. The word eukaryote and prokaryote originate from Greek language where karyot was taken from the word karyon, which means nucleus. So a eukaryot is actually a true nucleus, while a prokaryot is before nucleus, meaning that the original cells on this planet were prokaryotes, cells without nucleus. Later, the nucleus evolved and formed the eukaryotes. So let's have a look at the detailed structure of the prokaryote. Prokaryotes, or better known as bacteria, are unicellular and small, measuring between 1 to 5 micrometers. As we understand from its name, it does not have a nucleus nor a nuclear membrane, but it does have DNA. The DNA is located in the middle of the cell in a region called the nucleoid region. The structure of the DNA is not like human DNA, that it is not in the form of a chromosome, instead it is circular. Some prokaryotes have an extra DNA, a much smaller one called a plasmid. As mentioned earlier, the cytoplasm of prokaryotes is clear because they have no membranous organelles such as mitochondria or chloroplast. Prokaryotes have plasma membrane that is made up of phospholipids and protein. They do not have cholesterol nor carbohydrates. The plasma membranes are extensively fold inwards to form structures called mesosomes. Since the prokaryotes have no mitochondria, they store the enzymes in the mesosome to carry out respiration and generate ATP. Photosynthetic prokaryotes also store photosynthetic pigments in these membrane infoldings to carry out photosynthesis. Prokaryotes have cell wall just like plant cells, but the components of the cell wall are not cellulose like in plant cells, but a chemical called peptidoglycan, which is a mixture of protein and polysaccharides. However, the function of the cell wall is similar to the function of cell wall in plant cells, that is to give shape to the prokaryote as well as protect the prokaryote.
Some prokaryotes have an external layer called the capsule. Bacteria with capsule are more dangerous. The reason is because the capsule provides the bacteria with protection. So when the bacteria infects, for example, a human, the bacteria is protected from being engulfed by the human white blood cells. Besides that, the capsule also helps to retain moisture so that the bacteria does not dehydrate. The capsule can also help the bacteria stick to the surface of host cells that it wants to infect. Prokaryotes have three different types of hair-like extensions. The first is flagella, which it uses for locomotion, that is, to move around. If we do a cross-section of the flagella, we will find it to be a hollow tube. This means that it does not have any microtubules. If we compare the flagellum of a prokaryote with the flagella of, say, a sperm cell, we will find that the flagella of sperm cells have microtubules arranged in a 9 plus 2 pattern. However, the flagella of prokaryotes are empty. Besides that, the way the flagella move is also different. The flagella in prokaryotes move by rotation. That is, in a circular pattern as seen in this animation. The flagella of sperms move in a wave-like pattern. So you can see the flagella moves up and down like a wave. Besides the flagella, prokaryotes also can have another long extension called the pili. The pili's function is to help the bacteria attach to another bacteria so that they can exchange their genetic material. Usually, bacteria exchange their plasmids because the plasmids contain genetic information for antibiotic resistance. So, when one bacteria passes its plasmid to another bacteria, the bacteria becomes resistant to the antibiotic, making it more difficult to be killed. The third extension is called fimbriae. Fimbriae are used to help the bacteria attach to the host cell that it wants to infect. The cytoplasm of prokaryotes are clear not only because there are no membranous organelles, but because the cytoplasm does not contain proteins called cytoskeletons. The cytoplasm of prokaryotes also do not move. The movement of the cytoplasm is called cytoplasmic streaming. However, in eukaryotes, we are able to see the cytoskeleton, as shown here in the form of the green lines. However, the cytoplasm of prokaryotes does have one organelle, that is ribosomes. Ribosomes are present because they are non-membranous organelles. They are necessary for protein synthesis. Since they must be able to read the genetic code in the DNA to synthesize the necessary proteins for the survival of the prokaryotes. The ribosomes in prokaryotes are very small and they are considered size 70S. Prokaryotes have been on this planet for 3.8 billion years while eukaryotes have been present for the past 2.7 billion years. The question is, where did the eukaryotes come from? Or did they evolve from the prokaryotes? Let's find out. The first step to forming a eukaryotic cell has to be to form a nucleus. This could have possibly happened through the infolding of the plasma membrane extensively inward until it started to surround 
the DNA in the nucleoid region. So in this way, a nucleus was formed. The second step to become a eukaryotic cell will be to form a membranous organelle. Based on the endosymbiont theory, it is believed that larger prokaryotes began to ingest or eat the smaller prokaryotes. But instead of digesting the smaller prokaryotes, the larger prokaryotes decided to keep the smaller prokaryotes alive and live symbiotically. You see, this smaller prokaryote has mesosomes. So it is able to synthesize ATP by respiration. Over time, this prokaryote could have become the mitochondria. Eukaryotic cells with both nucleus and mitochondrion will develop into animal cells. For plant cell formation, there could have been smaller prokaryotes with infolded membranes rich in photosynthetic pigments. So, these smaller prokaryotes could carry out photosynthesis. When they were ingested by the larger prokaryotes, these smaller prokaryotes supplied glucose to the bigger cell. Over time, this prokaryote could have transformed into the chloroplast. And the eukaryotic cells that had nucleus, mitochondria, as well as chloroplast became plant cells. Chloroplast and mitochondria bacteria? Is this for real? Well, there is evidence. Firstly, let's compare sizes. The size of the chloroplast and the size of the mitochondria fall within the range of a prokaryote. And do you know that mitochondria and chloroplasts are the only organelles that have their own ribosome. It turns out the ribosomes are of the same size as what is found in the prokaryotes, that is the 70S ribosome. Besides that, chloroplasts and mitochondria are the only organelles that have their own DNA. And once again, the structure of the DNA is the circular ring, just as what is found in prokaryotes. The final evidence is the fact that only mitochondria and chloroplasts, as well as nucleus, have double membrane. These structures can only obtain a double membrane if they have been ingested. The first membrane or the inner membrane is their own membrane and the second membrane is from the plasma membrane of the larger prokaryote. So these four evidences support the idea that chloroplasts and mitochondria were once upon a time a bacteria. So with that, I end today's video. Bye-bye.